Welcome to the Sports Entrepreneurs Podcast. I'm your host, Marcus Lohr, and I'm delighted to spend the next hour with an old colleague and friend of mine and the voice and face of football here in Asia, Mr. John Dykes. Welcome to the podcast, John. Hey, Marcus. John. It's good to be doing this. Oh, great to be with you. Really looking forward to this. No, absolutely. And, and it's great to, uh, to especially bring old colleagues together um, over, you know, with people like ourselves who have been here for 20 years. Uh, now, I will do a bit of introduction, but I know most people will recognize you on your voice already anyway, um, but uh, not maybe everyone will know um, how you started and, and all the sort of different parts of your career highlights. So let me just get that going for real quick, and then uh, we'll get right into the uh, storytelling here. So uh, as far as I can tell, you actually started as a writer in South China Morning Post um, in the late 80s uh, in Hong Kong, I'm assuming. Um, moved on, uh, and then, uh, you know, quickly, a couple of years later, uh, I think it was your first uh, job in front of the camera, was TVB. Uh, then you spent a couple of years, of course, in the World Sport Group. That's where we uh, met each other. Um, and then moved on to ESPN Star Sports, um, the Premier League itself, um, in the production in the, back in the UK. Um, and the, in the last few years, you're back here in Asia, uh, based in Singapore, working with the world big Disney company here, of course. And uh, you have your own show, The John Dykes Show, which uh, airs on Fox Sports. So we'll go and get into all that stuff a bit more in detail. But that's, uh, it's obviously a, a very, very interesting career. Um, you pretty much spend majority of your time, besides the couple of years, I guess, as a producer, uh, really in front of the camera. And so that's sort of really the framing of our conversation here, um, whereas most of my previous uh, guests, of course, have been really more behind the scenes. So... But uh, as always, love to hear how you got into it. You know, what brought you to Hong Kong and, and how you got into the world of sports, I guess, in the first place. Yeah, well, um, let's just say that I very often get asked about this, particularly by uh, young people who might have graduated with a, a degree in media or um, TV and film or something like that, and or even people who are thinking about that. And I have to say, first of all, well, you don't really want to come to me in terms of me telling you that I took exactly that path. I am as atypical a career path as perhaps you could possibly imagine. I went out to Hong mm -hmm. Kong. Uh, my, my, my father was working there as a banker. I went out there right. uh, initially, actually, just for a holiday between school and university. I'd done some school in England, but the grades I got weren't quite what I wanted uh, to go to the university I wanted to. So I did a year of school in Hong Kong, which was a life changer. I mm. absolutely loved living there. I played every sport going. I was kind of physically a bit of a late developer, so I kind of blossomed by... You know, by the time I was 18, when I was still at school there, um, mm. I was playing. Uh, I was playing soccer, cricket, rugby. I was running track and cross country. I was just. I was just nonstop sport, and I loved Hong Kong. I just fell in love with with being in Hong Kong, being in Asia. Um, it opened up my eyes. But I went back to England for university. Um, didn't enjoy myself very much. Went back to Hong Kong every opportunity I could. And it was when I was at university that I actually worked on the radio station. I'm a big music fan, so I worked on the radio channel, the, 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 the university, the college mm -hmm. radio. Mm -hmm. um, and it was the first time I'd ever, because I'd never had a single clue what I wanted to do. Well, I'd played sport all my life and loved sport. And I'd always had these dreams. And I knew they were just dreams because, you know, if, if you're not making it by your late teens, you're not, you're not going to be a professional athlete. So I'd never really thought about work whatsoever. And even when I went to university, I did English literature because I happen to just love literature. Um, but I worked on the radio station. It was the first time I ever thought that you could translate, you know, an interest in, in something into a way of working. Um, I went back to Hong Kong where I interned at a commercial radio channel a couple of times. And then after a short spell, just writing in a sort of a short term job, writing ad copy for a China trade publication, bizarrely, just a friend got me into it. One of our guys moved to the Morning Post and shortly afterwards, this guy was an editor. He uh, introduced me to the Morning Post. I went in there and I, I knew a bunch of the guys because I'd been playing sport um, in Hong Kong. And so I knew a few of the guys on the sports desk. I went in and I wrote as a kind of cub sports reporter. Mm -hmm. um, and then really from that point on, Marcus, what was fascinating, I just got great advice and I'm eternally grateful. One guy on the sports desk said, yeah, you know, we could have you covering sport on a reporter basis as long as you like, but we reckon you write quite nicely. Why don't you go across to the features desk and start writing features, which I did. And it meant that I moved away from 
doing sport. I was interviewing um, politicians. Uh, I was doing features on lifestyle. I was interviewing uh, authors, celebrities, mm -hmm. just all sorts of, of stuff. And then from there, they, they realized I was I was interested in movies. And a guy on the TV Times magazine said, you want to write reviews? So I said, yeah, sure. So I started writing film reviews for them and for the paper as well. The good um, old days of and newspapers. Then, um, <laughs> Yeah, I, you know, let's face it, right time, uh, right place. There weren't a lot of people. I, I happened to be um, somebody who was blessed to be working on the biggest English language paper at the time. Mm -hmm. I had friends who worked on TVB, the English channel there, and they turned around to me and said, oh, hey, why don't you come on the, why don't you come on the show uh, and do a movie review slot? And you know what? I said no. I, back then, I, I was into writing. I was a very sort of opinionated young man who felt that TV was a bit cheesy, and I couldn't see myself staring down a camera and, and talking into a camera. I just couldn't see myself doing it. So I, I said, "No, guys, I, I don't think I don't think that's for me. I like writing. You know, that's I like interviewing people. I like sitting down and composing articles." But eventually, they talked me into it, um, and I went on there. And finally, they persuaded me to look down the barrel and, and talk to the camera. And you know, Hong Kong being what it was, I, I was lucky. Um, people. People just gave me breaks. Um, yeah. The film distributors were very happy to have me around because it meant that they had one guy working for the biggest English language paper and the biggest English language TV channel, yeah. which meant that when they had uh, junkets, they could say, well, there's two birds with one stone. So I found myself getting flown to uh, L.A. for the Jurassic Park junket, interviewing Sam Neill and, 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 and Jeff uh, Goldblum and, and Laura Dern and everybody yeah. uh, in Tokyo to interview DeVito and Schwarzenegger for Twins, uh, Tim... Uh, uh, I'm trying to think about. Well, uh, yeah, listen. I mean, I, I I just found myself in these situations that, to me, they were normal because they were what I did for a living. But looking back, it was hilarious being in Phoenix, Arizona, at the opening of a hard rock cafe, having a chat with Sylvester Stallone about a mutual friend in um, Hong Kong, mm. um, going on a a sampan ride in the Causeway Bay Typhoon Shelter with. Um, the Pet Shop Boys, because I happened to write a, a, a social and an entertainment column and the promoter of the show, you know, was grateful to me for publicizing the show. So asked me to go out for dinner on, on, on the harbor with these guys. <laughs> these are, you know, these are opportunities you just don't get every day. And of course, what you're about to say is, where was the sport? <laughs> yeah. And so I wasn't really doing sport. You know, I mm. was playing sport. And all the time I was on TVB, I still worked on the paper. But eventually... I went and worked uh, and joined you guys at uh, World Sport Group because I, I, I realized that I didn't want to just uh, work in the showbiz. I found it not something I, I felt that I could just do forever. I didn't, I didn't love the industry enough. Mm. Uh, I loved sport. And thanks to our former boss, uh, Seamus O'Brien, I got an opportunity to go and work and learn the ropes in, in, in TV sports production. So that's how I got into sports production. Yeah, excellent. And, and the part I really love, and, and obviously I'm looking at your CV here, that you know, for obviously quite a long time there in the early '90s, you really had two jobs, right? And and I think that's an interesting mm -hmm. one again. Um, that doesn't work for everyone, right? But in your case, you said you know you were writing on one side and you were you know put, getting in front of the camera on the other. And and so again, I think for young uh, for for someone in the in the current environment where you know jobs are clearly harder to get by, it's again you just have to be creative, right? And and and, and this yeah. is a great example for it, I think. I think what also happened there, Marcus, which was fascinating, was that I I got all these breaks and I realized that if you, and, and I think working in Hong Kong, I, we had a tremendous work ethic. You know, I, I'd, my first ever job had been for a, a Hong Kong company, as I said, writing these 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 this copy for a trade thing. Yeah. And we used to work long hours. And I think Absolutely. you just realized, you just you just put the hours in, you put the shift in, you didn't, you didn't, you didn't complain. And so there are two things about that, two sides to that. One is, that people will continue to ask you to do more and more and more. And I think the, the flip side of that is you have to realize at some point, well, hold on a moment. Am I stretching myself a little bit thin? And it got to a point where I was um, writing stuff. I was beginning to find my way in sports TV production, just learning how to how to shoot stuff, how to edit stuff, how to, how to make shows. And mm -hmm. then in the evenings, I was scrambling across to try and do film reviews. Now, what it meant was I think I was spreading myself a little bit thin. I didn't always get to see all the films I needed to, which meant I didn't have as many I could review. I didn't feel I was across all the stories in the industry I needed to. And 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 and, and by by the mid nineties I thought to myself, I really need to I really need to decide what I am here. Mm -hmm. And I, I decided to drop the showbiz stuff, move back to sport entirely. And that was when I was producing sport by day and I got an approach from Star Sports, who were then in Hong Kong. Um mm -hmm. And, and they had 
both production roles and presenting roles going. Mm -hmm. And I found myself telling this story to, to another former colleague of ours earlier on today. This was my sliding doors moment. Um, I got, a, I got a call one day from a very no-nonsense guy at Star saying, right, I am told that you work in sport. I'm told that you can present. I've seen that. I'm told that you also know a bit about production. So what are you? And I was actually stammering away on the phone going, well, you know, I can do this and I can do that. And, and a friend ran in, who was my boss at the time, actually, put his hand over the, the phone and looked to me and he said, mate, he said, tell them you're a presenter. Okay. So I did. So I said, I'm a presenter. Mm -hmm. um, the next thing I knew, I was I was commentating on Chinese Super League football. I was hosting a AFC um, Asian Cup football. I was filling in whenever the, the rugby guy wasn't around. I was filling in on Formula One because I was, you know, in a sports all rounder. Yeah. You know, and if it hadn't been for the guy saying to me, hey, there are plenty of us who, who, who can do production, but very few who can present. Right. You need to tell them you can present. I wouldn't have made the big jump. And that really was the big jump. Because when I went to Star, it was only a year later that I moved to Singapore to ESPN Star. Mm. And then I found myself presenting absolutely every sport, many of the major sports in, 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 world, in the world, um, you know, yeah, as a presenter. I, absolutely. I, again, I, I see this from, it really is from football, to rugby, to cricket, to Wimbledon and, and everything in between. Mm. Now, now, of course, you know, and we'll come to that a bit later, you, you are really in, in, the, in football. Um, but when you started, yeah. I guess you, it, it cut across. Uh, how easy was that, or, or how difficult is it to really be an expert in all of them, um, or, or come across as an expert? Well, I think one of the things, you know, and we're going to sort of jump back and forward here, and, and, and you know, very often I find, and I have found down the years, that I read interviews with people who are either just starting out. In, in, as, as, a, as a presenter or an anchor, or maybe they've been doing it for a while. And I very often find them saying, you know, they're asked a question about, you know, give some advice. And they go, well, first and foremost, I'm a fan. Now, I always completely disagree with that mm. because, yeah, of course, we're all fans. We all have a great interest in sport, a great love for sport. But I always say, no, no, no. First and foremost, you're a broadcaster. So what I found I had to do was having got a good solid grounding in journalism, you know, yeah. in, in, in interview technique, yeah. in, in, in research, in, in fact-checking, sourcing, mm. in uh, structuring stories. I found that then I had to learn about broadcasting. I had to learn the do's and the don'ts. I had to learn the uh, techniques um, that, that, that made you a broadcaster. So what are, what are some of the do's and the don'ts? That, tell us a bit. That, I think it's a great topic. Well, one of the first things uh, I did when I got in there was I didn't know how to talk. I didn't know quite how to pitch my voice. I, I didn't know quite how to appear in front of a camera because I hadn't been to a school or a college or a training course that taught me how to do that. I was just thrown in front of a camera. Oh, yeah. So um, a guy called Phil Betts, who still works in Asia, and he's one of the, the, the really, really good directors, sports directors around Asia. I said to him one day, what do I do when... I'm doing one of these hello and welcomes or these links, and then we're going to go to a recorded package. Where do I look? What do I do? And he said, well, that's a good question because he said a lot of people just kind of freeze and smile or just stop talking. But he said, I see what you're saying. He said, you need to move the viewer, don't you? And I said, yeah, I, I want the viewer to know that I'm going to take them somewhere. So he said, how about you look down as if you are looking down to a monitor? And then what I got from that was something that I've always used, which is the viewer is sitting there. They don't have a, a running order or a call sheet or yeah. anything that tells you what's coming. They're following you. So yeah. you've got to take them where, they, where they're going to go, where you want them to go. So mm. by looking down, they go, okay, he, he's now telling me that he's going to look down and we're going to see something. Similarly, when I have guests, I always say to the guests, look, if, I, if there are two of you and one of you is talking, the other one has to be looking, as I am, at that first guest. Because the, the viewer must be going, that's where we're looking now. Right, I don't right. want some guy talking and another guy gazing off into space because the viewer's going, well, what, is this not interesting? Is yeah. this not relevant? Yeah, so, yeah. so you know, you point. learn things like that. You learn things about pitching your voice. You learn things about doing research, about making sure that you know everything that you possibly need to know, but not over-researching, not, mm. not, not trying to digest a 30-page a sheet um, ahead of a football match in which you're only going to spend 10, 15 minutes on air learning to research for what you're going to need during a show, learning 
to, to, to work your way around the topics that are going to be questions that will come up, making sure you know everything about your guest so you don't ask them a dumb question that overlooks the fact that they once did something or mm -hmm. didn't do something. Um, all of these skills. And then, of course, the visual stuff, you know, presentation, how you look, how you present yourself, how, how you deliver your voice, um, whatever it may be. So these were all things that I learned as, as I went along. Um, and essentially, these were things that I, and you have to be self-critical. You have to watch the shows back. You have to ask advice. You have to ask advice of very respected people. Um, my, the guy who brought me to Star and then ESPN Star, Rick Dovey, our former managing director. Yeah. One time he spoke to me about pitching my voice, which was, which was a great piece of advice. Another time, um, I was hosting a live cricket uh, match that was coming over from England, and one of the umpires had made a pretty controversial call. And in the two or three minutes that I had just to lead the viewer back on air and back across to the live commentary, I sort of commented on, on this controversial decision the umpire had made and then threw back to the, I think it was probably Sky Sports commentary or whatever it was. A little bit later on that evening, I bumped into Rick, and he said to me, he said, mate, mate, it's going well. It's a good show. But he said, just one thing, I don't pay you to have an opinion. And, you know, that, <laughs> right. was, that was great advice because back then it, I wasn't a pundit. I wasn't an ex-player. I wasn't an expert. I was just the presenter who was putting this out there and, and, right. and taking people to and from things. And if I had a guest, it would have been my job to ask the guest to comment on yeah. what the umpire yeah. had done. Yeah. Right. And, you know, that informed a lot of what I did. A lot of the time when I was working, even in the, the football days, people said, you never tell us who you support. You never come down on the side, do you? And I always felt, well, part of it's in my personality and a larger part of it is in what I consider to be my professionalism in that it's my job to elicit that from an expert. Uh, it's my job to try and work towards that truth, maybe even to provoke it amongst the audience to get them thinking. It's not my job to go on there and pontificate about stuff because even though as we speak today, <laughs> and I have a show that's called The John Dyke Show, um, you know, it's not about me. Uh, it's about the broadcast, and the unity of the broadcast has to be the most important thing. Mm -hmm. I don't want ever to be better informed than my guest. I don't ever want to make out that I know more about a topic than my guest. I would play dumb and put the words in my, my guest's mouth rather than do that because right. it's about the broadcast being what the broadcast should be in the eyes of the producer and visually, of course, in the director. Very interesting. I, I, a couple of thoughts come in my head when, when listening to you. One is, of course, you know, there are different roles, even in the, in, it's not everyone is, uh, as you said, there is the pundit, uh, there's the live commentator, there's the color commentator, there is the, uh, um, the host uh, or anchor. Mm. Uh, what, which role do you always felt most comfortable in or, or what do you enjoy the most? Yeah, I'm, a, I'm a, if anyone asks me, I'm primarily a, uh, a live uh, anchor, a live sports anchor. Um, I, at the moment, I'm not fulfilling that role that much because what I've done in, in the last three years since I came back to Asia and worked with Fox Sports on, on the show that has my name on it is this show is very much me occasionally offering an opinion, but more often just exploring the, the talking points of the day, bringing guests in, bringing uh, some insight into headlines, uh, maybe trying to read between lines, maybe trying to explode myths, stuff like that. But what I did for the seven years when I was with the Premier League and what I did pretty much all the time for the 13 years I was with ESPN Star before that was mm -hmm. I, I anchored live sports coverage. I think it's what I primarily see myself as. And that really involves the ability to get on air, set up the story of a game um, or an event or a tournament, a competition, it, way, it may be, set it out there, get people the information they need uh, in terms of who's, who's, on, who's on the, the team that day, um, get some questions very quickly to expert guests who are able to, to, to put the event into perspective, uh, to offer insight on the team selection or whatever it may be. And then, of course, once things kick off, once things kick off, be able to really understand what has happened, to be able to tell that story as we come in and out of commercial breaks, to phrase questions and, and analysis uh, during our analytical segment, and really make sure that the broadcast uh, informs and entertains the audience. Uh, that's, that really underpins absolutely everything that I do. And, and, I, and I always quote this whenever I'm asked about how I do what I do. 
there was a very famous cricket commentator called Richie Benno, who was also a superbly uh, good foot, uh, cricketer for um, for the Australian team. He, he was a, he was the doyen of cricket commentators, and, and one time he was asked, you know, what was the essence of great commentary, particularly colour commentary? You know, the the the, the, the co commentator. Yep. He said, for me, what it is is it's answering a question just as it's beginning to form in the viewer's mind. Mm. And in that simple answer, I think Marcus, what he's doing is he's saying. We are hired as these experts because we have an insight. We can kind of preempt or, or, or kind of understand the sport maybe a little bit quicker than the viewers. And the viewer is sitting there just thinking, say, hang on a minute, why, why does this guy keep doing that? Mm. And just as that question bubbles up in that viewer's mind, we go, well, you might have noticed this is happening. Well, we'll tell you why this is happening. And that way, I think we all just, and that's why we love sport. I'm sure you're the same as me. That's why we love sports broadcasting because it just builds around the core event that's going on on the pitch or wherever it may be the racetrack and just enhances it and i think that's at the heart of what we do and that's what i love doing best particularly in a live environment where you have no water cue where you've got to trust your 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 knowledge your uh, ability to articulate to ask the right questions to follow up in the right way that's when i really get a buzz Mm. Yeah, and I can see that. I mean, and, and uh, first of all, you know, you you do an amazing job there. I, I love watching you on TV. Obviously, I've seen you, you know, almost 20 years here in Asia. Um, but I think to some degree, you know, the biggest one, maybe one of your biggest uh, outside of maybe what you're doing now, uh, clearly was when you were working with the Premier League, right? That's a global. Sh- that yeah. was a global show, you know, going around the world. Um, talk a bit about that. I mean, you know, you spend you know many years there. Uh, was the number one mm. football league on the planet, uh, being you know a big voice of that. Uh, you know, how was that? Just share some stories there. Yeah, well, the thing about the Premier League was that um, uh, I I'd been. I mean, at ESPN Star, just to go back in in, in the early two thousands, uh, we we won the rights. We bought the rights to Premier League Asia wide, right? Yeah. And when we started out, I think we went out to 27, 28 countries. It was pretty much all of Asia. First yeah. time anyone had done a, a regional deal like that. So That's what right. we did was we launched a whole raft of English language programming. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I was fortunate enough to host most of it, you know, a Friday night preview, mm-hmm. games all weekend long, a Tuesday night chat show called Football Focus, which became very popular. Yep. Now, <laughs> excuse me, as the years went by, you know, different countries, we lost the rights because, you know, cable operators went, hey, this is really, really a good product, you know, this Premier League stuff. We, mm-hmm. And they, we got outbid, so we lost it and, you know, different countries came and went. But what we'd already done was we'd already established this template. And I think when the Premier League very very smartly and i know that you 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 speak to phil lines very often phil lines was at the heart of this when he was Absolutely. working in the premier league at the time they were planning to launch this um 24 7 um hd um english language content service didn't mm-hmm. call it a channel it's a content service something that a rights holder who didn't necessarily have the capacity or the desire or the yep, inclination to make their own right. wraparound programming could take Yep. So, you know, it was it was wrapped around the games and it was um, shoulder programming going out Monday to Friday as well. So what happened, with, what was interesting, the Premier League were very aware of me because they'd come out to Asia, seen what we'd done. They were very, very, so professional, so hands-on in terms of knowing their broadcast partners, what they were doing, yep. helping wherever they could help. Um, and, of course, they had this Asia trophy, which would see them bring teams out to Asia. I worked on a few of them. Mm-hmm. And, and so I knew the guys there. I knew Richard Scudamore and Phil in particular very well. Yep. And when they wanted to launch this channel, word got back to me that there, there, there was interest in me being the, you know, the, the sort of main anchor mm-hmm. on the channel because they knew I'd done it and rolled it out across Asia. And therefore, this thing, which was to go across... The whole of Africa was super sport. Uh, it was to go across the Middle East region, uh, the Gulf mm-hmm. region, um, mm-hmm. and to come out to Asia with Singtel and one or two other countries was something I felt I could do. I could just, you know, I, I could go in and I would, I knew how to pitch it to a global audience um, because I knew the, the league inside out. I understood what the league was about. And yeah, it was fabulous. I'd never worked, you know, I, I'd only ever worked in Asia, Marcus. I'd, ne- I'd never lived and worked as an adult in Britain. So for me, it was a foreign posting. <laughs> you know, it wasn't something I'd ever planned. I, I had no, I'd never dreamed of working on BBC or ITV or anything like that. I, I'd never you know, wanted to host Match of the Day. I'd, you know, I, I'd, I'd visited England a lot through my yeah. job covering games and stuff like that but I, I'd never thought I'd be part of that industry so I went over there and the funny thing was I didn't become part of that industry because this 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 channel this this content service was not available within the UK yeah, they're yeah, the right sure. with Sky and, the and the variety of others 
it went around the world. So there I was in the UK working on this thing, which was a fantastic product. I mean, I, mm. I think the guys who set it up did brilliantly. Yeah, it was I'm so hard to pull it. this together. But we did it at IMG. We had staff. We had guys who came in who were guys who were either full time or or part time. But they were guys from Sky, from from uh, ESPN, from uh, IMG, from BBC, all over the place. And we just you know put this thing together. We got on air. We made a lot of programming. You know, we we. We were wrapped around all the games, and we went worldwide. And and you know the response was fantastic. Uh, other countries came on board. India. Uh, I had a lot of a lot of followers in India from the days with ESPN Star. Uh, didn't take long before they decided they wanted to take the feed as well. So I was very much conscious that that it was great to be driving this around the world. And you know I knew about the Premier League exposure. I knew how big it was. I I would walk back in the ESPN days into. Uh, a cafe in, in, in Kuala Lumpur or I would go to Thailand and people would point and they might not know my name but they would go Premier League or they would go football focus they knew exactly <laughs> you know what, what the brand was yeah. and, and it just expanded and so what happened with the Premier League itself was occasionally we would um, a few years into it the seven years we would go and do these fan fest events we did one in Mumbai mm. where we wrapped a weekend uh, with the club sending over legends and we had this huge stage with a massive, massive video wall on it and we would wrap it around live games. Right. We attracted 35,000 fans, Indian fans in Mumbai wow. to this huge open field with mm. a Liverpool Man United game in the background. I was on stage with uh, Robbie Fowler and Peter Schmeichel. Um, we mm. entertained them all day long. We had dancers, comedians, we did football chat, we had competitions, we had Booths, and we did the same thing, you know, a year or two later in Cape Town, um, and again, thirty-five thousand down at Camps Bay in Cape Town, coming in, and that was when I realised the Premier League brand was just enormous. And at times like that, I, I would walk off the stage and try and go to what, somewhere, and I'd be mobbed. Mm. You know, no, no, the really, footballers you're a star. Looking, the, footballers <laughs> be, the footballers would look at me, going, "What's this?" And I'd go, "Yeah, it's mad, isn't it?" And I said, "That is the visibility, the reach, the power of of that brand," because I'm just. Uh -huh. I'm just the guy saying hello and welcome. Here's the show, but but because they they want every part of it, uh, you're getting mobbed. You're having this incredible attention, um, yeah. and so I always understood that. I always realised that, that that my success, as it was, was going hand in hand with being associated with this yeah, massive brand, and previously, of course, with with the, the very big ESPN star brand as well. Correct. No, no, and, and I, I I can see that, and and that's what's interesting. Also, you know, I mean, we obviously have. Uh, you know, listeners from from all the different sports. Uh, you know what the Premier League did here, and how do you know? Obviously, this is not this is not inexpensive to do. Um, not every not yeah. every rights owner on the planet can afford this. Um, but taking ownership to some degree of your own content and becoming your own voice is really what the Premier League yeah. did here, right? It's rather than saying I'll just beam a signal out and I hope to God someone yeah. in, in wherever in the world you know does a good job communicating who we are as a brand. They took ownership yeah. of it, right? It, it, that's basically what what, well, what mean, they created, right? You're more of a you're, you're far more of a businessman than I am. But but what I realized straight away was that by having this um, English language twenty four seven, you know, good quality content available, you opened up exponentially. Um, the number of people that might come in and buy the rights. It no longer yeah. had to be people with a production facility. It no longer had to be traditional broadcasters. Right. It could be telcos. It could be brokerages. It could be agencies. It could be anybody. So I, I recognize that. Um, very, very smart play. Uh, what it meant as well was that they could go out to markets where they could have uh, you know, native language uh, channel, but they could also offer the English language channel, which means Absolutely. they covered it in countries like Thailand in particular. You you could cover the, 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 the foreign you know, English speaking market as well as the, the vast majority of Thai uh, speakers. Yeah, yeah, and I definitely, I mean, I think that's that's a key to the puzzle. You know, you have to be, it just, you know, every brand, and, and the Premier League is as big as a brand as any brand in the world, um, but a lot of times, you know, when you see sports, it is sent out as a pure signal, right? Yes, there is a host commentator and, and yeah. you know, and yeah. maybe a lead commentating out there, but uh, the Premier League really took this to another level. Now, I'd love to just, uh, before we go uh, into your own show, um, just, you know, you've obviously interviewed a bunch of people around the world, mm, um, you know, mm. big football players and, and probably others uh, from other sports. You know, what was the maybe one or two of the more interesting characters you interviewed? And that could be interesting as in they were really great or they were maybe not so great. You know, who would you sort of characterize yeah, yeah. here? Yeah, well, I think, you know, I, I'm a kind of glass half full kind of guy. So I think I was always privileged to, to, to interview people. And, you know, if someone wasn't great, I would do my darndest to make it great. You know what I mean? If you went into an interview thinking this guy could be hard work, you'd make sure you do all your stuff. You, you right. tried to 
you know, find the triggers that would make it great. In terms of the ones that I remember to this day, uh, and a real variety of them, firstly Thierry Henry. I went over to I, I went over to Arsenal and interviewed Henry, really in the mid in the mid twenties, uh, yeah, two, 2005, six, whatever. He was in his you know he was in his pomp, maybe right. 2004, five, I think. You know, invincible, just this stunningly talented footballer who was just mm. doing incredible things in the league. And I went over there. We put a request in. We got the interview, and I thought, "Wow, what's he going to be like? Surely this guy's going to be arrogant. He's going to be hard. He's not going to give us many minutes." And we went there, and you know, this guy wandered in. He was friendly, open, accommodating, but more than that, I worked out very quickly that he didn't just want to sit there and give a glib interview about how cool the goal was he scored the other day, or what a great player Dennis Bergkamp was, or anything like that. When I kind of took it into an area that he found interesting, and amongst things we spoke about were race relations in the inner city in Paris and maybe in some of the suburbs, which, of course, was stuff that predated some of the things we've seen recently. He mm. talked about father and son relationships. He spoke about his own father. And, you know, he got into stuff that I was never expecting. Uh, at the end of the interview, which went a long, long time, he got up, he shook the hands of every single member of the crew and you know, left a really, really good impression. And, and things like that were special. Um, yeah. I always liked the positives. Uh, Sir Bobby Robson, the late Sir Bobby Robson, was the most energetic, dynamic, and vital guy. You know, a truly amazing football manager. Um, mm. But more than that, just somebody full of life. We, After he lost his job with Newcastle, which hurt him so, so badly, he came out to, to Singapore, and we did some work with him. And we, we took him over to, to Thailand, actually, because what we used to do is the guys would come out and work on the show for two weekends in a row, but in the middle, if they wanted to, or if we had some work to do, we might fly them around the region and, and do some appearances. And just so happened, we had a, a, a dinner and then a golf day in, in Bangkok. And, you know, the guy was just shy. He was over 70, 70, 71, something like that. Hmm. Came out, worked with us, flew to Thailand, was absolutely amazing company on the night of our dinner, went out with us afterwards for a drink, got up the next morning, crack of dawn, as the rest of us did, and went to play golf. But the golf game, they scheduled this this sort of celebrity golf thing. Uh, I don't know how they or why they did it, but they scheduled me to play with Bobby and, and, and a couple of local businessmen. But we didn't tee off till 12 noon, mm. and it was a walking course. You know, what's that like? Marcus? This is in Bangkok. It's 30, 36 <laughs> degrees. You know, and you know what? This guy didn't complain, walked around the course, strode around the course at 70 something years old, shot mm. his handicap, smiled all the way, and was just a, a great, you know, great wow. advertisement. I learned a lot from him. He was brilliant. Last one, Michel Platini. I interviewed him okay. in a beating hotel when he was still head of UEFA in a mm -hmm. snowstorm, and he spoke to me about uh, video assistant referees and video technology and how he was so totally anti it, how he felt it would completely harm the spirit of football. It would go against what he believed was the essence of the game. Mm. Of course, Michel Platini has found himself in a lot of controversy and a lot of trouble since. But, yep. you know, for someone who was one of the footballers I really admired growing up and someone who purely just, just, just loves the sport itself, mm. when we spoke about things like that, I could really understand. And these days, whenever we have the VAR debate, I always think about Platini and, and about the way he so passionately argued against it. Uh, yeah, and I want to. I'll I'll come back to the VAR. Uh, VAR. I think that's a it's a very interesting topic. Uh, um, but before that, I want to just wrap up a little bit where where you are now, obviously, and that is your own show, right? The John Dyke Show yeah. on, on Fox Sports, yeah. and uh, and I remember we talked about it. The angle I really like here is that you you went from, of course, being a writer, getting on front of television, doing all these you know, amazing shows. Um, to now becoming your own brand, right? And, and that's, you know, yeah. and if you look at it in any sh form or shape, uh, even what I do here, maybe in a, in a much smaller level here with the podcast, it is about mm. branding yeah. yourself a bit, right? Creating a share of voice in a marketplace. Um, and I think that's clearly where, what you're doing so on a much bigger level here. So talk us a bit through, you know, the transition there. And, and you know, was yeah. it you saying, hey, I want to have my own show? Or was it someone saying, look, I'm, we're going to put a show and we're going to put your name on it? How, how, did, it, how did that all come across? Okay, well, before we get to that, let, let's, let's, let's go back. Now, obviously, you know, in the space in which you, you, you work, and of course, everyone who works, yeah, the people I know that work in yeah, sort of public speaking, motivational speaking, there's this assumption now that we all just know that you have to have a personal brand. You have to build your personal brand. But, yeah. you know, much in the same way that I was a reluctant TV presenter, much in the way that I kind of 
found my way into things. I never thought about a personal brand. I never even considered, even if it, we described it differently, having a personal brand until way, way into my career. I, I, I always recognized that I was fortunate to work for some big media brands from the South China Morning Post to TVB to mm. the ESPN Star and then Premier League we spoke about just now. So I always recognized that what I enjoyed in terms of success was because I was allied to these very popular brands, products, or whatever they may yeah. be. But it was only maybe midway through my time with the Premier League, as I said, when people started paying attention to me. And I think it coincided with the arrival of social media. I, I adopted Twitter fairly early. I liked Twitter. I found it quite useful just to get a gauge of the mood about something, to get some quick reaction, to have a sense of what people were talking about, not to use it as a, as a, as a, as a news source per se, but I found it quite handy. And I made a trip to South Africa. The, the licensee down there for the Premier League um, borrowed me, as it were, one summer to work on the World Cup. I think it was 2014. And I went mm. down there and I worked on that. And they said, have you got Twitter? And I said, yeah. They said, well, we'll, we'll, we'll put, it ha put a handle out on our shows. And I got 40,000 followers just like that because wow. they broadcast. We did the World Cup Pan-Africa and everyone knew sure. me from the Premier League. And suddenly I thought, this is interesting. Um, so what I found then was that I, I recognized or I began to recognize that, that I had a brand and I'm way behind it. You know, I didn't have a website. I'm really hopeless. I, I only just got a show reel put together because I've had this ton of sort of, well, not this ton, I've had this bit of disparate sort of, you know, video content that I've collected over the last maybe only seven, eight, nine years um, mm. that somebody edited together for me. I, I never collected it early on. You know, it's crazy. I, I know people who work in this industry literally so they can be on television. <laughs> and, and probably from the very first thing they did, they saved it, you know, yeah. and it now features somewhere or other. I was never like that. I was like, well, I happen to do this. It's kind of a cool job. But, you know, I didn't keep it. And I, I regret it. I didn't keep the interview with Thierry Henry. I didn't keep any of that early stuff. I don't have me right. anchoring the Masters from Augusta. I don't have me hosting uh, from Wimbledon or, or Flushing Meadows. I don't have that stuff, really. Um, mm. But I, I, belatedly, I realized that I was a brand. But what happened was I then also recognized that as much as I love being that guy that hosts live stuff, you know, you're only as good maybe, or you're only able to do that for as long as someone wants you to do it. And mm. if for whatever reason people think, oh, John's face has been on TV a lot, let's try someone else. Mm -hmm. Or if there are other agendas or motives behind putting somebody else on screen, you can't do much about it. You know, you can hire an agent who might be very influential, who might be able to make you, you know, get to the front of the queue, you, whether you're elbowing your way there or getting a knife out, <laughs> stabbing people in the back or whatever. I didn't really want that to be the way I lived. And I didn't want my career to be a case of me sort of just chasing after work and chasing after work in this kind of ever decreasing circle. Mm -hmm. But what I did realize was that this brand that I saw emerging might be something that I could leverage differently. And um, a guy uh, who works in the retail industry in Singapore, well, one, one year I was out working on a conference in Singapore and he said, what are you going to do? You're going to carry on doing that? And I said, it's a good question. I'm beginning to realize that maybe I don't want to just keep on trying to cling on to being that, that guy who presents the live football. He said, well, you've got a brand. He said, you've got an audience in Asia. Mm. Are there opportunities here? And I happened to speak to a guy called Italo Zanzi, who, who was yeah. fairly recently had joined Fox Sports. And this guy's just an amazingly astute man, a businessman, a, a sports administrator. And he sort of said to me, you know what? He said, I've recognized that football is, is, is really the big property in Asia, uh, particularly European, especially Premier League football. That's that's the thing. And he said, I, I recognize that you, you are the guy people in Asia very much associate with that. So he said, we're not a Premier League rights holder, but we really want to get into that space. And this coincided, Marcus, with me. You know, we spoke about the Premier League earlier on. How, Premier League earlier on, how smart it was to, you know, get as exposed as it did around the world and around Asia. The one thing that I did notice happening was that I think maybe due to the cost of rights, people were being able to buy the rights to it, get it on air at the weekends, but maybe not have the wherewithal or the resources to really service it properly Monday to Friday elsewhere. You know what I mean? And I felt that there was a gap. I felt there was a space that I could get into. And that's what Italo at Fox thought. He said, what about if you come out here and we leverage your visibility, your Premier League association, your branding, and we give you the resources that you need to make it happen. Could you do a show where we don't show a single moving image from the Premier League? And I said, that's really interesting. I've spent the last 15, 20 years doing nothing but you know, sitting on top of moving images of, of this sport. Mm. And we went for it and we decided that 
we could assume knowledge. Everyone had seen the games at the weekend. Why not now come and join us? And we'll give you some insight. Um, we'll tell you what the truth is behind this. Because let's also remember that through social media and other sources, there's an awful lot of rubbish on out there. People are being fed stuff that's not sourced. It's not journalistically sound. It's planted by agents. It's just wrong. And, and I think I was in a privileged <laughs> position to be able to understand and say, hey, you know that transfer story you keep seeing about that, which is being trotted out by every half, I won't say that word, news <laughs> operation out there. There's nothing in it. Right. There's, nothing, there's nothing to it. it, it there's, there's no legs to it whatsoever. Or, you know, have you ever thought that we're seeing this happen in the, in the league this year? Have you noticed this trend towards players doing this? Have you noticed this trend towards clubs doing that? So we felt that there was enough to do to, to editorially drive this show. And then the key component in it was they wanted really to leverage the various um, nonlinear platforms as well. So the idea was to put content out simultaneously attracting comments via social media, mm -hmm. answer questions live during the shows, but also build this community and take uh, my brand uh, across linear and nonlinear into the digital right. realm. Uh, oh, yeah, and really I was just going to ask that. So, that space. Correct. So it is really, <laughs> the show isn't just obviously for, let's call it traditional TV, right? You really go on um, and, and almost uh, is that simulcasting it in some fashion across all these other platforms, right? So, and that was always the idea, yeah. right? That was always the idea because I, like I, yeah. I was I was very much aware from my time at the Premier League that the feedback I got through social media told me that there was an incredibly articulate, football literate, if you will, audience out there that yeah. wanted to talk about it. And I think in Asia, broadly speaking, had been under serviced or under under appreciated in that regard. And, okay, we're doing it in English language, which just means that certain people struggle with it. But I think there's enough people out there, and I've been vindicated in that with the size of the community that's grown up around my show, to recognize that if we get on air and say, hey, that thing you saw in the Premier League yesterday, what do you think about it? Because mm -hmm. I think this. And the guy I've got on from England, who's a journalist who covered that story, he thinks that. Or Mark Schwarzer, who, you know, who played all these years in the Premier League. Um, he, he can tell you that the, the, the reality of what's happening at Chelsea really is this rather than that. Um, yeah, we, we found that by, by putting it out there, by attracting this community, by allowing this community a voice and then engaging. Because what happens is when I finish that show, that, that 30 minute or one hour slot, mm. it doesn't end there. I, I then jump onto our Facebook page, which is where we carry our content simultaneously as well as on, right. on, on the Fox channels and what have you. I jump on there and I chat with the guys. I answer questions that have come right, in. Right. We, 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 we take it off. And I often see guys spinning off into a little chat of their own. We get stuff uh, across all of the Fox Sports uh, pages. We've now got the ESPN part of the, um, um, the offering as well with, with, with the Disney ownership of the company, which means yeah. that we're now putting ESPN FC on our channels, which means that you know that's driving that, that uh, debate as well. So we've got a lot right. happening in that space. And, and, and I just think it's... Yeah, yeah, I think it's great yeah, to be part it. of it. And, yeah. You know, as and, much and again, as I would uh, love uh, to sit there and do live football, it's, it's, I recognize that this is a very important space for us. Yeah. And, and again, I, you know, I'm always trying to bring it back also for others to learn, and, and it's a perfect example. This can do everything. Any, anyone can do this in any sport, right? Um, cutting yeah, across different yeah. platforms, creating content maybe for one particular purpose, but then repurposing yeah. or, or like you said, you know, after the show is over, it's not about the day is over. You then go in on Facebook and you answering questions, you further communicating with the fans and keeping the fans engaged, especially mm -hmm. in this sort of environment now. So let's get a bit in that um, in that side of it. You know, we're currently in an environment where everything we're just talked about <laughs> isn't quite happening. Yeah. Right, so uh, so yeah. let's talk about a bit uh, the world of no sports um, over the last couple of months, and hopefully, you know, and I and I want to quickly, I want to, I don't want to spend too much time there, but you know, how did you see it again from being there? Um, you know, uh, normally very actively involved. You know, the Premier League uh, mm -hmm. would be in the final sort of stages now, or almost done. Yeah. You know, and now it's not happening. You know, how have you lived the few, last couple of months here and, and and seen it from your side? Well, you know. Personally, purely selfishly, it's actually been fine for me. And, and in a way, and, and this is not something any of us ever foresaw or anything like that, we have made three shows a week, nonstop, ever since football shut down. 
and we're continuing to do so. We reduced the length of our Monday show from an hour to half an hour because there simply weren't games to describe. But yeah. we were actually in a really good position, Marcus, because if you think about it, I, I had a show that talked about the news and informed people as to you know what was going on, what the truth is. And we've been hearing all of these things about when leagues can restart or start or train or will they be canceled or avoided. Mm -hmm. So there's always an update to be had and there's always right. insight to be sought by right. getting to somebody who might be able to say, what, what really is the truth in, in, in the Premier League? Are they going to meet and do this? Or are people really saying that you can't do that or, or, or you can't train right. in this way? But so there was that, enough that material was, around to, to play with. Material. Yeah. Right. But the other thing as well that you'll have seen, everybody's been like revisiting um, archive. Everybody's been doing lists, the best this, the best that, the greatest that, the what have you. But that's what we were doing anyway. We always felt that we were putting football into a context. We were doing themed shows even when football was going on, saying, hey, let's have a little think about the best defensive midfielders that we've ever seen. Where did they come from? So for us, it was quite natural to just carry on mm -hmm. making fairly similar content, tweaking it a little bit. Um, and then obviously working with the constraints. Um, and as you know, I mean, broadcast has been done very much remotely. We were blessed in that we were able to make programs from our studio twice a week rather than three times and pre-record one of the shows mm -hmm. using incredibly versatile um, crew members and, and staff members who just delivered the most amazing results, very often multitasking, doing three jobs at the same time, because we had to adhere very strictly to uh, social distancing and Absolutely. staffing limitations to do yeah. so. But we decided that Pulled it was it important off. that we do so. Um, I have so much respect for people who've managed to set up and re remotely broadcast from their own homes, wherever it may be. And we've seen some tremendous advances in that. But I think wherever possible, if you can look as good as you can, if you can use lighting and the good cameras and the set, do so. And we were blessed in that we were just allowed to do so. As a result of that, we've carried on. And I, I think in a way, and the feedback I've had has been, thanks, guys, for carrying on. We're so grateful for you to keep because we miss our football so much. Of mm. course, I wish we were watching football and talking about football. But what we've done in the meantime is we've, we've tried to just supply something that keeps people going. Yeah. No, no, absolutely. Now, let's move a bit ahead here. You know, let's think about where do we, you know, and, you know, you obviously have your eyes and ears on the ground probably as much as anyone. Um, what do you see here and, and where do you think uh, what's going to happen here over the next couple of weeks? Uh, you know, of course, the Bundesliga is starting this weekend, hopefully. Yeah. Um, yep. you know, but Premier League still seems to be a bit off um, and the French have completely stopped or, or thrown in the, uh, what's mm -hmm. called the thrown in the towel, which I think was wrong. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'd love to hear your thought on that. Yeah, um, I think we've all had the conversation. Firstly, you have to take away the tribal aspect. This is not a case of do Liverpool get to win the league or do we not want Liverpool to win the league or this, that and the other. Yes, yeah. that's a factor. But I think the initial reaction was all about that, wasn't it? Oh, my goodness, can you believe it? You know, after 30 years of waiting this... And very right. soon, within weeks, even Liverpool fans started saying, this is bigger than that. This Absolutely. is about the whole essence of sport and, and what sport means and whether we should be doing sport or not be doing sport, what it means to communities. So the conversation has changed. I think um, trying to complete a league makes sense to me uh, whenever it happens. Um, it, it just rounds things out. And you know from the business side of things, it, it just completes deals, it completes cycles, it, yep. it completes sponsorships. Keeps now that the they've decided coming. what to do with player contracts, yeah, it, it gives you a bit of closure, I think. So if you can try and do that, you do it, which is where I think the French uh, got it wrong. But then again, remember, everyone's been led by government. The French League didn't want to, to, to cancel it. it. It was because right. of a directive from, from government, right? Yeah. So... Um, I think everything has to be driven by the broader society. I know that uh, sport and football in particular is developing ways in which they can almost keep the players and those involved in, in, in delivering the sport in a bubble in a way that might be a little bit, shall we say, safer than, than the broader society. OK, you can take that into a, an area of morality or politics, if you will, but let's just keep it to delivering uh, sport. Uh, Korea, uh, they launched the K-League last weekend, yep. but remember they only did so, and remember it wasn't a relaunch, it was the launch of a new season, but they only did so after they'd had firstly 14 consecutive days in which the country had fewer than 40 new cases of COVID-19. Right. And then, even when they had that 14-day streak, they built a 10-day cushion in before they kicked off. So they, they, they left 
you know, as little to risk as they possibly could. Mm -hmm. Germany's going ahead this weekend, i, I got to say, live on Fox Sports. It's a fantastic um, um, opportunity for us to, to push a Can't product wait. that we really love. Five years of the Bundesliga, and, you know, we love it. It's fantastic stuff. Um, but anyway, you know, but even two or three days ago, you know, new cases in Germany were still 900 to 1,000 or whatever it may be. So yes. I think, obviously, as you can see, they've had to be very, very strict, uh, very rigid, rigorous in their protocols. I like what they've done. I like the way they've gone about it, the way they have set out a template that other major European leagues are looking to follow. Yeah, I think I would agree. you only have to read about Britain to recognize that for one reason or another. And I'm, I'm not a political animal, so I'm not going to point a finger of blame here. It, it looks as if maybe the policy leadership um, infrastructure, resources, um, the reaction of the society, whether it was compliant or not compliant. I think all of these have added up to a difficult environment in Britain. Um, and so the numbers are still big, which means that when people jump up and down and say, you can't come back now, well, they're not talking about playing league football now. They're talking about beginning a training process, working through that process, which will go through you know, as we now know, individual training into small group training, then into another phase of training with very strict hygiene and, and testing protocols in place. Then they have to decide if they can, by maybe mid-June, deliver a product. It seems to me that the noise around all this is going to keep pushing it back in, in the Premier League markets. I, 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 I would be concerned that that it, it yeah, and June 12th was the date they initially said. I, I think they'll miss that. Um, the more noise there is, the more dissenting voices, um, it could push further back. However, I watched Korea in the K-League last week, and it looked like football to me. It didn't sound like it because there were no fans there, but <laughs> we're going to have to look. That's something else we need to talk about. That's the new normal. Um, yeah. I think if Germany goes off, I think if it's good competitive football or as good as can be hoped in the circumstances, then I think people's minds will change. I, I yeah. think people will shift their attention um, to, let's make football work in Italy, Spain, in, in England. Absolutely, yeah, and, and I want to get last one last question on the Premier League, and then we'll t we'll go and, and sort of go in the wrap up part here, you know, cool down phase uh, of the new normal, uh, and that is, yeah. and this is my opinion again, reading you know whatever between the lines here, that they seem to be not that all the clubs really see eye to eye uh, in terms of how to start, who to start, and you know, and clearly there is some jockeying yeah. going on, uh, especially maybe in the in the, the the clubs in relegation zones about you know what happens if we need we need to draw out and uh, yeah. what is it what, what's your opinion on that I mean that, I think it's again is a really interesting obviously topic yeah it's a very interesting topic and you know again it gets tribal again people talk about self-interest but, but you're naturally going to have self-interest because let's take relegation for instance um, you, the teams haven't all played the same number of games which makes it complicated in a couple of areas uh, yeah. that, that are decisive come the end of the season but also um, if you look at the way fixtures are stacked, um, you look at Brighton, they've, in the, four of their next five games might be at home, but those mm -hmm. four games are against both Manchester clubs, Liverpool and Arsenal. So, yeah. you know, any, any attempt to artificially end the season by putting a waiting in or just putting points per game together, I think would be maybe unrealistic, and certain mm -hmm. clubs would argue that case. Um, yeah. I think where possible, you have to remain true to the integrity of the competition, which means not neutral venues, venues rather, you have to play at home, go back to Brighton, you know, yeah, they've got tough fixtures, but they'd rather play them in their home stadium. They'd rather have their, you know, comfortable home familiar surroundings to play in than, than, than be playing in a neutral venue. So I can fully understand that. Um, mm. I think some of the bigger clubs also said, you know, we'd like to play uh, in our home grounds and play at away grounds. And I think as soon as the police got involved, and remember, they're an important uh, stakeholder in the whole uh, thing in the British game, especially in yeah. terms of granting licensing and, 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 and assessing safety. They said, yeah, we're OK with that. Then I think that was one major obstacle that was overcome. The training protocols uh, are strict and, and, and they need to be adhered to. Uh, I have my reservations about that. I think the biggest thing is the players. Uh, a lot of players have come out expressing concerns, managers too. So they have to do a very good job of being transparent, um, of mm. persuading the players and the managers that, that, that the time frame is correct. But again, I think the Bundesliga will be a big pointer towards shaping people's opinions. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think everyone will you know, be watching um, how this works or not, uh, and, yeah. and it's again, no one knows yet. You know whether they truly be able to pull it off, uh, or the whole thing will be pulled very quickly. So, uh, and, and that's yeah. sort of maybe a good, good way to sort of finish up um, our conversation here. Uh, you know, on one side. You know, even if we have football back, we all know for a while it will be without fans, and that's 
already weird and and unique in its own way. As you said, you know, you're watching something yeah. without you know all the fan noise and the excitement around it. You know, you can pump in, I guess, fake sound uh, the same way you see, yeah. uh, you know, real other sort of TV programs where you have fake laughter. Why wouldn't you be able to do that in, yeah. in sports? I guess uh, it still doesn't yeah. quite create the same atmosphere, obviously. But at least from a television audience point of view, it would maybe you know could become a. Uh, and then hopefully, you know, God knows when that maybe is uh, later in the year or, you know, it depends on when, when uh, governments are ready for it, of course, letting the fans back in. And that's what we all really you know, yeah. want to do. And, and yeah. we're, you know, as a company, actually, we spend a lot of time in this space right now. We're, we're, yeah. we're looking at everything from screening mechanisms and other, you know, things from mm -hmm. masks of how we can work with clubs and leagues to, to bring them back on air. Right. And I call it, you know, bring the live game back to life. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. you know, what, what, what is your viewpoint on that? You know, you're looking in a bit into, into the future. Where, where do you see things happening? And, and, you know, is there even a crystal ball? It might not be. Yeah, I think what's, what's fascinating is this has made us address really the, the, the whole live sports experience from a virtual perspective as well as that kind of, you know, on the ground. This is a game. The crowd is making this noise. This is a visceral experience, and it's something that we'd all been working towards in a couple of, you know, different ways. I think there was that multi-screen experience. Let's take it from the mm. Asian fans' perspective, where you'd have the game on with all the atmosphere that you'd normally expect. Uh, rather than just watching on the big screen, you've got various screens. You know, you've got your yeah. fantasy page open. You've got your forum with your mates discussing things. You've got something else on the go, gambling, whatever it may be. Right. So, so we were already exploring the different ways that we consume the match. The, the, how much attention do we spend looking at the big screen? What about that screen? What about that? Who are we talking to? What, what, what's shaping our, our match viewing experience? So I think that was already beginning to happen. Now this has taken us into this sort of production side of things. You're right, pumping sound in. The Koreans pumped sound in. Early on in the game uh, that I watched last week, it, they didn't have it, and I didn't like it. Once they mm. started pumping stuff in, I knew it was fake, but I didn't care. It just felt better. It just felt better, and I think maybe yeah. the players might Agreed. respond to it a little bit more. Um, if, if you do a Munchen Gladbach and put cardboard cutouts in, fine. If, if you think that might work. Uh, you know, I think everyone's going to have to explore the different ways in which they review all of our thinking about what constitutes this game. You can't wrap a whole stadium up in a green screen and project stuff onto it yet. You might be yeah. able to do that with other sports. You might be able yeah. to get into a huge hangar and, and, and play a game with, with, with everything, just project it uh, virtually yeah. uh, using virtual and augmented technology. Um, you can work. I think one interesting space for me is going to be getting into – obviously, we can't do viewing parties because if you can't go to a game, then you can't go and congregate with a fan yeah. club in a, in a big hall somewhere. That's not going to happen. But you can um, do it remotely. So we need to get into how the community is engaging with the game, whether that means – when I was watching uh, K-League, I think it was on Twitter, I saw comments scrolling up through the game, mm. whether we need that kind of engagement, whether we should have a virtual projection onto the match coverage, expressing what people feel about it. Um, mm. I know there was a German company that was trying to develop an app whereby fans could pipe, you could pipe the fan sound into the ground depending on their reaction. At a certain right. time in the game, they whistle. At a certain time, they cheer. At a certain mm -hmm. time, they boo or clap you know what i mean yeah. i think these are all these are all spaces that the uh, areas that we need to look at and i know you are you, you you'll be thinking a lot about this yeah absolutely and, and i think that's uh we will for sure as an industry we will find a host of new things no doubt because we'll all foster it we have no choice we have to create something where the football okay is happening on the pitch but you know we need to make sure the rest of it um, it brings you know is is something more exciting created than uh, than just having a bunch of people running around uh, with no sound on a, on a field, right? That's yeah. a good start. Yeah. Um, you know how fast we can bring the fans back. That's the ultimate trick, right? Uh, no one ever wants to go for on forever um, and just play virtual games, of course. Uh, so that that's the obvious. Mm -hmm. uh, how do we make it safe and bring them back? Um, but there will be technology, and 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 one of them, of course, and and, and maybe that's sort of our last. Uh, Last little point here, we, and we mentioned it earlier. Already, yeah. Of course, it's VR, right? Which I actually like. Um, I think, and it's my, my five cents worth of it. Um, as much as it's, it's still not perfect, of course, we know there is still controversial uh, yeah. decision making and uh, and probably plenty of wrong decision making uh, potentially. Uh, but that's that was the same before anyway, right? I mean, the referees were never yeah. perfect, and because they couldn't see it, no chance. 
Um, now they have another tool, and they might still make mistakes, but uh, they, therefore, in my mind, it doesn't really uh, change that part. But I do think there is decisions now which are clearly, truly were wrong, and now there is a mm. chance to review it and, and talk well, yeah, about it. Yeah. Or, so that's my view. You know, but love to hear your thoughts. Well, no, I, I, I agree with you on that. I mean, just quickly, my, my last point, and this kind of takes us back to where we were just now, is this. I, I've long wanted or championed getting the viewer as close to the sport or involved in the sport as possible. On VAR, it showed up for me that a lot of the regulations were badly written. Okay, so the, the, the rules need to be written better. So you, you, mm. you don't have this kind of uh, uncertainty. Secondly, yeah, the way it was um, put into effect in, in the Premier League was wrong. There needs to be transparency. You need to see the, the referee uh, looking at a monitor, seeing what the referee is seeing, therefore second-guessing what that referee's decision process is, which gets you involved, and yep. then whether you agree or disagree with the uh, decision afterwards, at least you have been involved in the process. Going back to what we were saying about the whole overall live sports experience, I, I, I just think whether it be wearable technology, whether it be miniature cameras, whatever, I just think anything that we can do to get the viewer closer whether it be yeah. on a camera on Paul, Bogba, Paul Pogba's shirt, whether it be a microphone picking up comments, whether it be anything that gets the sports viewer to feel as if they're part of the experience, you know, tracking Absolutely. the heart rate of somebody as they're about to take a penalty kick and being able to see that visually represented on screen. That's an area that I think we inevitably should go already going in, and I think that will accelerate. Absolutely. Yeah, 100% correct. Um, and... Uh, you know, augmented reality as well in other areas where you would look like you would see, you feel like you're sitting in the game, right? You would sit on the mm -hmm. front line, you know, like I, I love the basketball example always, you know, you sit in that row where the celebrities yep. are and have a game, have the chance to watch there, um, you know, yep. or be, you, you are know, Jack Nicholson. yeah, exactly. Or you be in the ring with the, with the fighters or, or of course on the field with a footballer. I think those are, those are things which, I do believe will happen, um, and I hope actually that the industry now, where we have to create something else, right? And the more we're going to start seeing the games coming back, and they will look weird yeah. for sure. Um, I, I do believe. I, I was talking to someone in a completely different industry, but linked to a technology, and they're basically they said to me, "What well, what have normally taken us two years to do? We're going to have to do now in the next three months, right?" And yeah. so that is the acceleration really of of speed that. I think leagues and everyone will be forced um, because no one knows yet when we can really bring the fans back and let's call it, you know, have a slightly more normal environment again. And in the meantime, yep. let's just go, uh, you know, and push technology out and try new things. And like you said, whether it's microphones on the pitch or whether other things which, you know, takes the viewer into a completely new world where they normally wouldn't do it because you didn't have yep. to necessarily because the pro no, there was nothing wrong with the product, right, in the larger scheme of things. Um, but now you have to, and, and I do. I think that's the exciting part. So I think both of us are excited over that, and hopefully the decision makers in the leagues, as well, of course, in these technology companies, can really push this. And maybe over the next, you know, six, seven, eight, twelve months, while we still have to watch uh, empty stadiums, uh, they bring that, and, mm -hmm. and uh, that would be an amazing, amazing, you know, thing to watch for sure. Yeah, brilliant. I'm 100% with you. That, that's great. I think that's a great way for us to wrap this up because you know what that means? It means we've got something else that's going to keep us going and you know, just, just keep us going forward. Yeah. yeah, well, you know, we can talk football forever. That's the beautiful part here. Right? <laughs> that's, uh, that's the, you know, is a, a topic we can go on and on. So, John, thank you so much for your time here. It was a great, fun hour. Uh, hopefully the, the, the listeners will enjoy it too and, and really getting a good sense of what it means to be in front of the camera, you know, and how you get to it. Um, and, uh, and wish you best of luck with the show and, of course, everything else, and, and stay safe there in Singapore. Oh, well, the same to you. And, um, you know, keep well. And uh, it's, it's a pleasure talking to you. And I, I look forward to uh, uh, getting any feedback from this one. I mean, people can reach out to me. They're more than welcome to do so. But uh, I'll stay well, and I'll talk to you soon, Marcus. Definitely. Thanks, John. Talk to you soon. The Sports Entrepreneurs by Marcus Lure Podcasts are a collection of interviews and stories. All content in this podcast is the copyright of Marcus Lure. 
reproduction and distribution of the presentation without written permission of the owner is prohibited. All rights reserved.